Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 11, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending once again. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I need to work to get the reminders out and get the show back up to uh, be in broadcast, or I should say um, not promoted, but just... <laughs> Seems like only a select few of you now know where the show is, but I'll work on that. I promise. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. And this week's focus is going to be mostly charts with a few random thoughts. I woke up this morning thinking a lot about trading psychology and how do I wrap trading psychology into a nutshell, and that kind of let me led me to – the things that you need to come back to, whether you're getting started trading or whether you've been trading for a while and you may have lost your way, which we all do on occasion. And then that got pretty deep and broad. And somewhere along that, I had a tangent into the, the recent batch of scumbags that are out there that are beginning to frustrate me. A, a new client recently confronted, not confronted me, but ask me if I would uh, tell him who I thought the biggest scumbag was currently. And I, I wouldn't do it, but uh, I think that if you dig a little bit, you'll find, and maybe I'll hint around a little bit in just one second. So I backed off on the deep dive into trading psychology, and I think we're going to come back to that in a few weeks. By the way, next week I will not be doing a show. I have to have surgery on my elbow from all of this computer work I've done over the years. It finally has caught up with me. All right, there's the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, one thing I want to talk about is that you don't want to be doomed from the start. And this has been part of many presentations in the past, but when it comes to trading, you really have to be careful. And the thing to think about is this, I know a job, you're, you're in a job to make money and, and there's all these different things attached to money. But in trading, it's it's so directly connected. And the bottom line is whether you're a capitalist or not, money is freedom. If you have money, you have the freedom to do a lot of things and it should not be taken lightly now the question is do you have the time even with help and by the way we all need help so what i'm saying there is it does take time to become good at what you do and one of the things that i kind of one of the changes i started to go off on this morning was deliberate practice and I've done quite a few presentations on that I would urge you to strongly study that the people who are most successful in life whether it be an athlete or a CEO or whoever they they work to get better at what they do or a musician would probably be a really good example too chess player and they know they don't just practice they practice deliberate practice and that's a very important thing that you should do read some Malcolm Gladwell on that uh, Anderson is someone else and those two seem to have a riff but it's really not a riff and I, there's some articles on my website and I think there's a lot about deliberate practice and learning management system too so make sure you give yourself plenty of time the ultimate goal is freedom here but you'll have less freedom while you're learning and we're continuing to learn in this business. So be willing to work hard at it. Another thing is think about how long it took you to become a doctor, lawyer, automatic transmission mechanic and trading is no different. In some ways it could be, I don't want to say even tougher because automatic transmission mechanics and doctors and lawyers get mad at me when I say that, but in some ways it can take longer. Maybe that's another way of putting it simply because there's no defined career career path and that's another one of those tangents that I occasionally go down and done quite a and I've done quite a few presentations on that so one thing is you really want to make sure that you have time for this endeavor 
and I've made the mistake of trying to help a few people recently in the markets who aren't traders. And it's like I told them that the market was iffy. Well, that was a couple of months ago. So they got out of the market and they're probably cursing me right now. But I also told them at the same time, why don't you spend as much time as you spend on your hobbies and other things, or maybe even a fraction of that amount of time to understand how markets really work and how they go up and how they go down and sometimes how they go sideways and figure out what your plan is going to be. Now, as far as making time, somebody asked me a while back, how do I how do I find a time? Well, you make the time. You get up two hours early every day, and that's how you can make some time. Or identify when you're possibly wasting time. My big tangent lately has been on the micro versus the macro. Are you doing something in the micro that could hinder the macro? Are you wasting time in the micro? Now, I think we all need a little guilty pleasures here and there, but just be cognizant of how much time you were spending. And a lot of times you can, if you really identify everything, you could probably make the time. And the reason I have Jocko will link down here is that discipline equals freedom. The more discipline you have, the more freedom you will have. Now, it's it's it kind of goes both ways, though. Discipline means that you're giving up a lot in the process. You're going to have to give up freedom to get that freedom. And I get up at 4.55 every morning religiously, except on weekends. I'm not that good. I'm not that crazy. But I get up and I start working, and I do something ideally cerebral early in the morning to where I can use the best time of my day when I'm not being interrupted by a lot of other things, such as the markets and clients and things like that. Now, of course, you always have to ask yourself going in, are you ad adequately comp capitalized? Now, if you're not adequately capitalized, easy for me to say, it's not the end of the world, but what you want to do is use what you have to get educated. Now, by educated, yes, buy some courses and books and things like that. Don't go overboard, though, okay? You can learn a lot, a little uh, shameless plug here. I mean, you can learn a lot from me without spending a whole lot of money. In fact, right now on my website, you can start by reading my first three books absolutely free. The other thing you could do is you could get your charts set up fairly cheaply and start looking at a lot of charts. And, of course, paper trading is free now the good thing now about paper trading which makes it a little bit harder i used to always say i've never met a successful paper trader well i might have to eventually change what i'm saying there because now that brokerages have these simulated accounts and now that they're more prevalent and easier to access and free they, i think if you really start placing those paper trades so to speak with a brokerage account it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to be successful as a paper trader but even still you're still going to have to at some point put some skin in the game and that's a whole nother psychological or psychology type of presentation on that and that goes for a lot of things in life and the one thing i'm coming back to uh, one of the books that i found while unpacking a box was the SFO Psychology of Trading Personal Investor Series. And this has got a, quite a few different uh, people who are known for trading psychology, such as Brett Steenbarger. And they kind of come back, and this is what, what has me thinking about the deliberate practice. See, I told you to be random today. And in this book, and I think it was Steenbarger talks about someone such as like a professional chess player, they don't play for fun. They they have some skin in the game. They have some reason for playing. And then it's like there's been studies before where people, if you don't keep scoring a game, you really don't try that hard. So that goes for life and in trading. But until you actually put some skin in the game, you won't know psychological issues that you're going to have to deal with. And here's a big one. Do you have the support of your significant other? And if you don't, you want to lay out a well-defined path and you want to be accountable. Now, 
that's not easy for many, and many aren't willing to do that because that's really, really tough. As one client once said, who had plenty of money, I basically said, could you lay out your plan because you your stock picking is really good and you make a lot of money and then you kind of blow up a little bit because you get careless and you don't honor your stops and you don't take the profits and then you partial profits along the way and then you micromanage yourself and then you push the leverage a little bit. Can you lay out a well-defined plan to your wife and then follow it and explain to her what you're doing? That's kind of the short version of the story. And he says, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So you have to be willing to be accountable. It would not end the marriage because it's not a marriage. It would not end the marriage because of him laying out the plan and following the plan. It would end the marriage because he would say, I'm going to do this and then go off and do something completely different. And in holding himself accountable, he wouldn't be willing to hold himself up to the scrutiny of those questions. So anyway, this is a, a kind of a little tangent that might be going on soon, kind of a trading psychology light or in a nutshell or cocktail napkin. I'm working with a, a trader or two and we're trying to reduce their grail searching down to something much more simpler, kind of more of a cocktail napkin type of thing. And I think that's where some of this psychology is coming from. How can I reduce that trading psychology down to a bit of a more cocktail napkin? And you, I'll have more to say on that in future presentations. But the one thing I did want to talk about today is to be realistic. And I don't know why it's bothered me so much. Maybe it's because these people, these scumbags are out there fleecing these the, the average retail trader. And I guess it's... Uh, putting a bad taste in their mouths and, and making them skeptical. And they should be skeptical. You should be skeptical. But I just hate to see people get harmed by this, this recent batch of scumbags. And it's bothered me more than it should. Now, I do think, I do think they're going to be going to jail soon. In fact, I was on Facebook and I, and I saw something popped up in one of the feeds where one of the persons affiliated with a bunch of the scumbags is probably going to jail for $700,000 of embezzlement. Now, this is not related to trading and markets, but I think it sort of illustrates the company that they keep. If, if they're willing to hire people that are thieves, then it kind of questions their integrity. But a lot of other things that are being done without going into a lot of details, I think will probably end them in jail soon because a lot of these things are illegal. And I'll just, I don't go off on too much of a tangent here because I really want to jump into the charts and talk about trades and trading. But a lot of the things that they're doing are illegal, such as pump and dump. And basically pump and dump would be get into like a penny stock and then send it out to a whole bunch of subscribers and then everybody rushes in and they rush out. That's illegal. That's known as front running. There's a lot of the things that are being done that I would think that the SEC would eventually raise an eyebrow to. So I think the cream will rise to the top. I'm far from perfect. I don't have the Holy Grail. I probably spend too much time talking about that, but just be realistic if you are being kind of taunted to jump in with your hard-earned cash with some of these self-professed gurus. Now, the bottom line, this is like life, okay? If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And even if they did achieve some sort of greatness, the question you need to ask is, could they, could you repeat it, okay? Because it doesn't do you any good. And then the next question is, can they repeat it? Well, if you could turn 10,000 into 10 million why, and, and do it again, why wouldn't you just keep doing that and just rinse and repeat? And this kind of makes me think of like, the I'm fortunate in that I've been able to brush elbows with a lot of famous money managers. And at the bar, I've never heard any one of them brag about their trading prowess. So 
a good trader is humble because the market will often humble you. And the question you would ask is, can I repeat it? Well, I had the luxury of meeting someone who made a lot of money in the markets. And he told me, he said, Dave, I was in the right place at the right time. Now, this person was brilliant in that he recognized he was in the right place at the right time. And he made millions. However, he is not out there suggesting that you can too because he knows that he couldn't do the same thing again. So you can't take anything away from someone from being in the right place at the right time. But if they suggest that it can be repeated in current market conditions, then you have to be a little bit skeptical. Now, what I would suggest, too, is stay away from the church of what's happening now, with the exception of your conceptually correct methodology. Well, what was it last year? Last year, it was the 420 stocks, the weed stocks. That was like big push, big push, big push. We're all going to get rich in, in weed stocks. And then the year before that, it was Bitcoin and the cryptos. And everybody went nuts on that. And these people spent millions in marketing and they fleeced people for millions in that. Well, what is it now? Well, it looks like it's going to be 5G, okay? So what I would urge you to do, and I have a Bitcoin example in one, exa in one minute, but I would stay out of the church of what's happening. Now, if somebody else is promoted, promoting that, at least, with the exception of following your own methodology. Now, last year... I had a lot of weed stocks in my Landry list, and I think we had a couple of them showed up as official recommendations, and I think we did okay in them. But what's interesting is I didn't even realize they were weed stocks at the time. And the good thing about that is that's just me following my methodology. And if you're following a minimum-based methodology, then these things will present themselves. There's no secret out there to finding the one that's going to be the huge winner. You let the price action take you in or get you into that winner, I should say. And, of course, the money management keep you in or take you out. Now, this is kind of a fundamental argument, but it kind of works for this situation, too. If you think about fundamental analysis, okay, where you're looking at the actual fundamentals of a company to try to gauge whether it's a good company, bad company, or should be bought, you have institutions out there with billions of dollars and unlimited resources, virtually unlimited resources, and they can't figure out a way to make fundamentals work. So what makes you think that you're going to be able to make fundamentals work? And that's where it all comes back to price. So you, it's very hard for me to believe that some newly printed guru is going to know from a fundamental standpoint what that next, let's just say 5G stocks, because that seems like that's the latest, is going to be. Now, I'd be willing to bet it's going to be a pump and a dump situation. So be really careful about the church of what's happening now. If it's the church of what's happening now that's being promoted, nothing wrong with looking into the weed stocks or the 5G stocks or whatever the hottest thing is. Now I have a watch list of weed stocks that I go through. I will occasionally put together watch lists for hot sectors and go through those or make sure I give them an extra look. I also maintain my IPO watch list. And if you have time, go in and watch the Q&A from yesterday where I talk about how to create that IPO watch list. And then I went through those IPOs, the new IPOs, to see if there was anything worth trading. So... Again, if you are going to follow the church of what's happening now, and as a trend follower, you should. Don't follow some self-proclaimed guru out there that's telling you what stock to buy if you spend some money with him, and then he gives you the secret stock. After he, of course, piles into it, so he's front-running. But if you are going to do that, just follow your methodology. And then the example that I think would be a good example, this is from last week's Week of Charts, was the Bitcoin trade that I took recently. 
Now, you haven't heard me talk about Bitcoin in a while. while. Why? Well, it hasn't been set up. It's been goes, going mostly down for a long, long time. But now it's time to go back in, or it was time at least a couple of months ago, or a month ago, I should say. So nice little Dave Landry type of setup there, nice little money management. And then knock on wood, so far so good. I think it went a little bit higher than it is here before beginning to correct. So use your methodology to play the church of what's happening now, but don't get sucked in by the scumbags. A couple more things, and then we'll hop to the charts. If you are a member of DaveLandry.com, if you're a gold member, I would urge you to join the Facebook group. My ultimate goal with all this is to create a mastermind group where we could help each other. I don't want to hold myself out as a be-all, end-all, grand poobah. I need help just like everyone else sometimes. And it also helps to have an extra pair of eyes. And I've picked up a couple of stocks out of the group so far. And thank you guys for that and girls. So I would urge you to join the Facebook group. And I'm working towards a one-to-many business model on the educational side. And part of that is, is just I'm physically going to have to. I have, you know, I'm possibly facing four different surgeries. Uh, it, one for sure next week if I don't back off on the one-to-one -one interaction, which is, which is killing my, uh, my hands and elbows. Anyway, this is an example. We had the TIGR trade recently. And what I'm doing there is I have the trading service where I'm following the core methodology. And just outside the core methodology is something like IPOs where some of the stocks may be a little bit thinner. They may have a little bit more breakout characteristics and things like that. So that's some of the things that I'm bringing up in the Facebook group. And a lot of other people are bringing up stocks that we discuss, which I think is great. And the great thing about that is it's not like they're bringing them up in the week of charts and then I post the week of charts three days later and everything is already done with the stock, whereas this we're pointing out things in real time. So anyway, just real quick, this was the Tigger trade and we talked about it ahead of time. By the way, your guru, okay, make sure he tells you what he's going to do ahead of time. Now, I wouldn't suggest you front run him, but at least if he tells you ahead of time, you know what he's going to do, and you're not the victim of him. You're not helping him make money by your buying and him dumping on top of you. So be really careful with that. And so I threw out the Tigger trade as something I was looking at, and that was before it actually triggered. Anyway, so that's the trade there. We decided that a two and a half point stop was appropriate, which gives you a two and a half point initial profit target. And that's how it's shaken out so far. All right, let me get up the charts. And you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Okay, let's start off with the S&P 500. And then we'll drill down to some individual sectors and go from there. Okay, S&P 500. Obviously, the big blue arrow is pointing higher here, okay? My big concern remains, and I know I've been saying this ad nauseum, is this V-shaped recovery at a high level. Let's take a look at maybe a weekly chart so you can see that. When a market sells off hard after hitting all-time highs and then bounces right back, it's very hard for it to sustain that longer term rally. And as I often say, it's sort of like running a race right after you ran a race. Even if you're an incredible athlete, you're still going to be a little tired. So very tough feat for a market to do that. Yeah, keep the stock picks coming. I'll get to them just in a few minutes. We just have a few charts to go through. So... Again, we're very overbought here. And what happens in these overbought situations is you could bump into a double top, a head and shoulders top, or some sort of other type of topping formation. Now, 
as a trend following moron, you just want to follow along as long as it's going higher. We don't want to try to second guess and say, well, it's going to stall at the prior peak or it's going to turn into a double top or a triple top or whatever. Head and shoulders top. But we don't, we also don't want to put our head in the sand. And we can't just say, well, it's going up now, it'll continue to go up forever, because as you know, maybe it won't. But that's my big concern. Now, keep in mind that in markets, there's always something to worry about. But so far, we're not that far away from all time highs. Now, if you're following something like the TFM 10% system, which you can go back in and look at recent chart shows for that, or take the free market timing course on my website, daylandy.com slash members, you'll see that we are in long mode on that. Because why? Well, the market is within 10% of its all-time highs, plus it has some other caveats. And I think that everything was programmed for 50-week highs, so it's within 10% of 50-week highs. Also, by the way, S&P 500, new highs for the year or not too far from new highs for the year. So psychologically, that's very important. Now, speaking of psycholog psychology, think in terms of what people are thinking in the market. And I, and I do a lot of man-in-the-street type of empirical research. So... I usually hold back my ego, which isn't hard, which isn't easy, <laughs> believe me. And, and I scored very low in agreeableness on a, uh, a personality profile psychology type of test. So it's hard, but I just kind of listen in. And, you know, one guy had CNBC on in his place of business, and he was talking about his trading, and, and he's – He's so glad he held on through the December slide, and he wished he would have bought more. Well, that'll work until it don't. So what could happen is those people who held on, if this market sort of continues like it is and then begins to die, they could all panic and run for the door at the same time. So I think everybody now is breathing a collective sigh of relief. Now in the case of the person I just said, I guess I'm confusing things a little, I guess he would start buying more on the way down, and at some point if he doesn't blow up, he would might be inclined to dump stocks at the worst possible time and exacerbate the slide. But I guess that's all hypothetical, but what would the world be without hypothetical questions? That's right, with a W. Anyway, so we're not too far from all-time highs. We take a quick measurement on that. 1.39%, less than a half percent, one and a half percent for government work. Let's measure the NASDAQ since we're here. Less than 2%, so a few big updates, we'll be back to new highs. That would certainly be a good thing. But, again, I just think it's going to be very hard for the market to sustain that. Now, shorter term, looking at the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, you can see that we have lost a little bit of steam in here. Notice that we kind of took off on a short-term basis and we're losing some steam, but we're still hovering around this overbought level. Now, I've talked quite a bit about overbought, oversold. So without going into a lot of details, just know this, number one, if you measure from these lows going way back here, it's 20 something percent rally in just a few months. That's a huge rally, a huge rally. And obviously, that's going to be hard to sustain. Many years, the market does not go up 10 percent in an entire year. And sometimes it goes down a little bit, obviously, and sometimes more a little bit. But that's a substantial move. That's enough for an entire year. So, markets are doing okay, but let's not start kissing each other just yet. I am not 100% long, but of the positions that I have, I am 100% on the buy side, okay? So I am following along, but I think the point I'm trying to make is make sure you have a chair ready for when the music stops, not if the music stops. 
let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty, if we take a look at weekly at a Rusty, we've had the big thrust down and we've had the big retrace up. And until proven otherwise, I think the Rusty still could be in trouble. But on a weekly basis, it's looking okay. It's trying to come back to this prior little peak. Let's take a look at the daily. You can see up a smidge today. Very important for this Russell to get past 160. And then after that, we have some overhead supply to deal with. And let's take a measurement off of this just to see where we are. And we are 9%. So we're still a ways away from those all-time highs. So the... Let's take a look at a weekly chart and let's put in a let's put in a 50 day moving average. Yeah, keep the keep the stock picks coming. We'll have plenty of time this week. So we take a look at a 50 week moving average. And let's do this. That's a daily moving average. This is a 50 week moving average. So even though we're less than 10% away from all time highs. We also need to have a little daylight above that moving average or Dave light or Landry light. I forget what we call it nowadays. But that just means that the lows are greater than the moving average. You can see the light between the moving average and price like we had back here. And if you go way back in time, you can see that that simple little technique, okay, daylight to the upside, could help to keep you on the right side of the market. In other words, you want to be long when the lows are greater than the moving average, as a general statement, and you want to be short when the highs are less than the moving average, as a general statement. Now, some caveats and things, and you want to have setups and money management and all those other things. But if that's all you knew about markets, I think you would do a pretty good job of staying on the right side of the markets. So as we are now, the Russell 2000 would close above the weekly 50 week which be a, which would be a good thing but I wouldn't get too excited until and unless we take out the recent highs in here and ideally you start getting some upside Dave light or Landry light like we have in the Nasdaq and the S&P 500 and again look at this nice little trend here all contained by the lows being greater than the moving average I guess we'll call it a Landry light all contained by a Landry light just got it. My wife's been on me for years to put my name on something. Why can't you put your name on something like John Bulliger? <laughs> I don't know, babe. I just need to do that. Sectors are looking pretty good as a general statement. The commodities have woken up a bit lately. They have a little bit of overhead supply to deal with. Let's take a look at the dollar really quick in here. And there's been a little weakness lately in the dollar. I'd see it's popped up a little bit today. And at the least, it's traded sideways. So that might be helping commodities a little bit. Some of these areas, like the banks, are trying to crawl their way back higher. My big concern here is there's a lot of overhead supply to get through. And if you take a look at the XLF in the financials, you could see that they have a little overhead supply to get through and they just don't look as good as the rest or most of the rest of the indices. So again, there's always something to worry about, but that has to be concerned. Now on the upside, if you take a look at like the semiconductors, they're looking pretty good. I'm a big fan of the semis. I'd rather take a look at the semis and check them out as opposed to like the transports. I know some systems use the transport transports as one of their criteria or people put a lot of what's the word credence into the transports but if you look here you can see that the semiconductors are right here at all-time highs so that's a good thing is there an inverted head and shoulders on the IWM well there might be but I like a I like a bottoming pattern at serious serious bottoms and not at tops so what do i mean by that well 2003 2002 2003 2009 those are the areas after a long bear market i'd be more interested in looking for a bottom than 
at a top. And that's why that V-shaped recovery has me concerned. Um, I suppose it's a, an inverted head and shoulders. But with the head and shoulders, one thing that you want to see, Frenchie, is this. I like to see, and I'll show you a couple things that I, that I like. And this comes back to the psychology of things, too. So let me draw it in. Let's say that if you're going to have a head and shoulders bottom, I like to see, so a head and shoulders bottom be what? Would look something like this, okay? I like to see that right shoulder lower than the left, okay? And the reason being is, from a psychological standpoint, it makes people think that we possibly are going back to old lows. It shakes out a few more people because of that. And then the market can go higher. Same thing on the top side, okay? The best head and shoulders you're going to find are the ones where that, high, that right shoulder is higher than the left, okay? And that's because, like I just said, people think it's going to go back to the old highs. People think it's the old clear. It's all clear. So you really need to think about the psychology of what's happening. Now, with that said, I guess you're right in the fact that, in the sense that that's a shoulder, that would be a head, and this is a possible shoulder in the works. But notice that this one is higher than that one. I'd actually prefer that to be lower. Those tend to be the better ones. And the other thing, again, and let me just clean this chart up, I would much rather look for a bottoming pattern at bottoms than a bottoming pattern at top. So somewhere like 2009, again, I'd be more excited about that, 2002, 2003, but not so much at a top in here. I mean, it's market that if we measure from 2009, See, that's like a longer-term bull trend, if you want to look at it that way. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that the market can rec can't recover and keep going higher as it did back in 2015, 2016. But remember, that was a pretty serious slide in here, too. We had weekly sell signals back here, and the market dropped. And I'm just kind of eyeballing the weekly chart. But if we looked at the actual systems that triggered, it was 18 to 20%. And as I often say, the media, not that it matters, but the media defines a bear market as 20%. So that was a pretty ugly uh, slide that we had back then. Anyway, I hear you, but I think a better one would be lower right shoulder and not at a top, okay? All right, most of the sectors are looking pretty good in here. Couple of technology areas like the semis we just talked about at new highs, software at new highs, doing pretty darn good in here today, notwithstanding so much, but you can see doing well in general. So for the most part, most areas are hanging in there. Let's take a look at bonds. Bonds have pulled back in here so far though, just kind of looks like a pullback for the real aggressive, maybe keep an eye out for an opening gap reversal. Go in and watch the last three, I think, Q&A sessions for a lot more on opening gap reversal trading. I don't think you're going to get rich trading opening gap reversals, but I think there's something there. The point I want to make with bonds is, or any other stock for that matter, or market, if you have something that's set up as a pullback, you got a nice thrust higher and you got a pullback, one thing you can do as a day trade, and I'm not a huge fan of day trading, but you can make a little money here and there. If you get a significant gap low or look to play a reversal back in the direction of that trend. And those are one of my favorite patterns to play just for, just to pick up a little money on the side. I think TMV or TMF would be one of those direction funds you can use to do that. Just make sure you get the right one. And if you're trading opening gap reversals in general, like in the overall market, make sure that market is very overbought has that gap higher where everybody rushes in and then look to play that intraday reversal like that with the hopes. And I know I shouldn't say hope, but you have to have some hope, right? 
with the hopes of capturing a trend day in the opposite direction because the most amount of people or are going to be on the wrong side of the market or at the least will have the wrong opinion when the market is doing those type of things and then you can get a quick little pop on a reverse and again that's just that's not your bread and butter that's just a way to make a little money on the side all right chris wants to talk about urbn waiting patiently all right chris good to see you urbn Okay, this is a transitional type of setup, meaning that it's banging out lows and then starts headed higher. I have become more and more selective over the years. I like to see many year lows. Now, I guess it's a two year low. I guess that's okay. But in an ideal world, I like to see a major, major, major low before looking to play them, but it's certainly not bad. I just prefer this low again to be more than a couple of years. We have a bow tie higher as you can see, so good eye on that. A little bit of resistance to come over, to overcome I should say, but not enough to worry about too much. So I'll give it an okay. I will personally pass on this one just because we're not coming off of like major, major lows like we were back here. But maybe I'm being a little bit too much of a perfectionist but again, for a transitional pattern, I want it to come off major, 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 major lows. You're welcome, Frenchy. FTNT. Okay. Well, the problem I'm seeing here is, okay, where are your highs? Where are your lows? So it's in this big, wide and loose range. You want to be trading something that's in a nice trend and not just something that's kind of breaking out a little bit, unless you're trading a fairly new IPO, like we just talked about that TIGR, where we do trade a little bit more of a breakout characteristic. But an established issue, you don't want to be looking to trend trade. You don't want to trend trade when it's in within a longer term range. OK, so find something that's been trending a little bit better, a little bit cleaner, and it's up in fresh air, so to speak, clean air. V N T R. Okay. Well, this is one I was looking at a while back, and and getting back to that transitional thing, this would qualify as a transitional type of setup because it sold off for a long, long time, and it made all time lows. So this one was on my list for a while. Just never really got the setup that I wanted. I would prefer I would avoid this one for now back here was kind of interesting because it took off this probably a bow tie in here if memory serves yeah you had a bow tie here not perfect but bow tie here all-time low there so possible transition in the works but since that setup it's kind of like a Janet Jackson you know what have you done for me lately well it's just pull back pull back pull back it's gotten choppy in here so for me to get interested in this one again, it would have to ideally come back down, retest its lows, bottom out for a while, and then form another transitional setup. Now, maybe if it has a thrust and then a pullback, I'll reevaluate it. But for now, I would like to look at it through the lens of a possible trend transition because we've got such a longer term downtrend in place. And then maybe look to play something like a bow tie or a first thrust but only if it went down and challenged new lows and started over and reset up. Okay, CVM, did we talk about that one? I think we did. Yeah, TW. TW, I like, sort of. It's, it's headed higher, it's looking pretty good. Let's see, one, two, let's put a moving average in there. Let's put in a five day. If you go in and look at the the five day IPO thing that I did with moving averages. And I think it's actually on my website now. Oh, it's not platinum yet. But it could set up with that. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Why is it not plotting? It could set up with that really soon. Usually after day six, you'll, you should get that average plotted. The range just doesn't seem quite big enough for me. I'm a little bit more skeptical with these pioneer setups 
when the range isn't really, really big and when the price is a little bit higher. But you could certainly use the five-day moving average to help get you into these positions. One, two, three, four, five, six. We should be getting a moving average in there soon. And if you look on my website, the article I did on Lyft was actually a repurposed article that I did on Blue Apron, which was actually a repurposed article that I put out from, what was that other stock? Snapchat. And then pretty soon, I'll probably be doing an article on Uber. <laughs> Because it's probably going to be an Eleanor's super duper hyped, crazy, crazy stocks. So let's see if we can do. But go in and read that or go in the member system. If you go in the free area under members, I think it should be there now. And then I have a lot of stuff that's under. Yeah, there it is. I have a lot of stuff under the learning management system, obviously on these type of setups. So let's take a look at that. So under free stuff right here, LYFT. So right now the free stuff is the Recent columns and a couple other things, but it's under the members area. You can get to that. Members area is right here if you don't see this article on the home page. So I would hold off for now on this one and look for a possible secondary setup. But yeah, I hear you. It's definitely at new highs, and then one of my or actually a couple of my IPO systems or to just buy IPOs at new highs. And that's exactly what we did with the with the Tigger. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So the buy was right there with this one. And then again, we took profits where? 14.55, I think, somewhere in here. And then now we're trailing a stop higher. So not a bad pick on the TW, just not something that I want to go after as a pioneer type setup or as a, that's probably the best way of putting it. So by pioneer, I just mean early in the trend for an IPO stock. So let me just draw that in really quick for those who are a little bit newer to the IPO stuff. So once an IPO has been trading for a while, maybe a month or two or a few months, then we're looking for something like a normal core methodology setup, like trends and like a trend knockout or a pullback or something like that. When they're in the early phases of trading, as early as one, two, three, four, five, there are cases where we're actually going to close of day five, such as the TIGR trade. And there's another one we're looking at for today, actually. Dave, what is it? Well, go take a look at the Facebook group. And if you're not in a Facebook group and you are a member, join, and I will let you in. We, our job is to help each other out. But the Pioneer setups are early in the stock's life, as early as the close of Friday for a stock that comes public on Monday morning. Okay. The secondary setups are still quite worthwhile trading in many cases, but if you have a stock such as like the TW or whatever, as a general statement, a lot of times those stocks, higher price, lower range, I'd prefer to wait for that secondary type of setup. Okay. FTEK, did we talk about that one yet? FTEK. Okay. Um, you can have too much of a good thing. And in a case like this, 
this stock went from one where to go from somewhere down here to somewhere up there so that's a hundred percent in change and probably a lot more on a high to low basis so more than doubled over very over a very short period of time so the first thing i tell you is yeah good eye okay the second thing is when you see such a massive rally like this you want to make sure you have a really deep correction even deeper than what's corrected so far but the other thing of concern is a lot of times you get what I call a bottle rocket. You'll get a stock that just really takes off, but then it quickly loses steam and dies out. So it's made such a massive move over such a short period of time. I would go ahead and pass on that. If you did trade it, I would suggest you wait for a deeper pullback, and then I wouldn't bet the form on something like that. Look at the HV up there about close to 91. Also relatively thin based on the... It's only a couple of dollars a share, so multiply the share price times the average volume. It's not that big of a stock. So, yeah, you want to be really, really careful. AYX. Um, first thing I see here is, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I see one month of sideways trading, okay? And then if I go back a little further, I see where it really didn't break out past this prior peak. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't keep going higher, and maybe it'll turn into what I call a box stock, where it makes a box, goes up, makes a box, goes up, rinse and repeat, like darvis style trading. But for me, I'm just kind of seeing a stock that's kind of wide and loose and all over the place, even though it has worked its way higher. I'd prefer to trade something that trades a little bit more cleanly. All right, Chris says, IIPR, trigger a pullback trade recently. Yeah, I mean, it's a REIT, but it's a REIT where it has decent volume and not so much decent volume. It's a decent volatility. And it also has decent volume. Look at the HV, 54. That's quite a bit for a REIT. As a general statement, I'm not very excited about trading REITs. But I certainly hear you. It's like a nice trend higher, a nice deep pullback, a nice trend higher. Now, this pullback did pull back a little bit into this prior pullback. I'd prefer if they didn't do that. So, yeah, it looked okay on this little run here, but not as good as this pullback right there. So, yeah, good eye on that. And that was definitely a setup back then. Okay, any more? Well, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a good weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Remember, no show next week. I'll see you guys hopefully in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much.